Testing, one, two, three, three, two, one. Testing, testing, testing. All right, welcome to Empty Cross Ministries Devotional Time. I'm Brother David. The name of the program is KJV Exposed. That is King James Version Exposed. Because we use the King James Version, we look at each verse, break it down, bring it to life, and expose the meaning. We haven't been off for a few days, and we once again we've got behind on our daily Bible reading plan. <clears throat> Excuse me, which I just uh, updated for today's reading, and I would encourage you to follow along with and read along with that. That is designed to get us through the Bible in a year's time. Each day there's a passage from the Old Testament and a passage from the New Testament. It will only take about 10-15 minutes of reading time to get through that. Excuse me, I need to sneeze. <coughs> Alright, I'm glad that's over with. Today we're going to be looking at the Minor Prophet of Habakkuk chapter 2. And let me get that pulled up here. Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 1 reads, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Stand upon my watch, comparing himself to a watchman. Look at Ezekiel's, Ezekiel chapters 3 and 33. Once again, comparing himself to a watchman, standing as a sentinel upon the city walls, Habakkuk prepared to wait for God's answer and to ponder his reply. Habakkuk is speaking in this verse. He is waiting to see what God will say to him. He is not shrinking, he is not shirking his duties. In the meantime, he will still act as the watchman. We see that Habakkuk separates himself from this sinful people. He goes aside, perhaps to a place in the mountains, until he hears from God. He is expecting God to reprimand him for the questions he asked him in chapter 1. Verses 2 through 20, in response to Habakkuk's second complaint, verses Chapter 1, verses 12 through chapter 2, verse 1. The Lord announced that he would judge the Babylonians as well for their wickedness. His reply included, number 1, the instructions to write it down as a reminder that it would surely occur, verses 2 and 3. Secondly, a description of the character of the wicked in comparison to the righteous, that's verses 4 and 5. And thirdly, the pronouncement of five woes describing the Babylonian's demise. That's verses 6 through 20. Verses 2 through 3. Write the vision. Habakkuk was to record the vision to preserve it for posterity so that all who read it would know of the certainty of its fulfillment. Similar language is in Daniel chapter 12, verses 4 and 9. The prophecy had lasting relevance and thus had to be preserved. Although a period of time would occur before its fulfillment, all were to know that it would occur at God's appointed time. Look at Isaiah chapter 13, Jeremiah chapters 50 and 51. Babylon would fall to the Medo-Persian kingdom of Cyrus around 539 B.C. Look at Daniel chapter 5. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2 reads, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make a plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Write the vision upon tablets refers to the common practice of writing public notices with such large characters on the clay tablets that someone running by 
could easily read them. If the notice was a warning, it would also cause the reader to run quickly to prepare for what was coming. That he may run that readeth it, perhaps referring, number one, to clarity of form, so even the one who runs by it may easily absorb its meaning, or secondly, to clarify of content, so that the courier can easily transmit the message to others. There really is no reproof in this. God does answer Habakkuk, though. This is telling Habakkuk to write the very book we are going through here. The reason God wanted Habakkuk to write it down was so future generations could draw from it. Habakkuk is a book that many scholars have drawn from. In the earlier devotion, in the earlier devotional, we mentioned the fact that Paul quoted from Habakkuk. We also mentioned that Martin Luther started the Protestant Reformation after studying Habakkuk. Many have been so moved by this little book that it encouraged them to be workers for God. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3 reads, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. An appointed time indicates a specific future fulfillment of Habakkuk's prophecy of the fall of Babylon. Look at Daniel chapter 5, verses 30 and 31. Every person who has a vision of a work God would have him do could be inspired by these words. God does things in his time and not when we think it is time. Notice, in all of this, God does not scold him about the vision or even the questions he has asked God. He explains that sometimes they do not come to pass at the time of the vision. They may happen weeks, months, or even years later. The vision is for a time God appointed. God reminds Habakkuk that he is to patiently wait on the answers to come. When the appointed time comes, they will not tarry. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 reads, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. His soul which is lifted up, while the context make this, makes this an obvious reference to the Babylonians, the passage introduces the marks which distinguish all wicked from all righteous, regardless of ethnic origin. Two opposing characteristics are here contrasted. The proud trust in himself and the just lives by his faith. Number one, the proud, haughty Babylonians who will be the victors in the forthcoming conflict. And second, the righteous ones of Judah who will appear to be defeated in the forthcoming conflict, but in reality will be the victors because of their faith in the Lord. The just shall live by his faith. It's often quoted in the New Testament in support of the doctrine of justification by faith. Look at Romans chapter 1 verse 17, Galatians chapter 3 verse 11, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38. Thus, this Old Testament prophecy anticipates the New Testament gospel, which shall ultimately conquer the nations and bring them to Christ. In contrast to the proud, the righteous will be truly preserved through his faithfulness to God. This is the core of God's message to and, and or through Habakkuk. Let me say that again. This is the core of God's message to and or through Habakkuk. Both the aspect of justification by faith, as noted by Paul's usage in Romans chapter 1 verse 17 and Galatians chapter 3 verse 11, as well as the aspect of sanctification by faith, 
as employed by the writer of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 38, reflect the essence of Habakkuk. No conflict exists. The emphasis in both Habakkuk and the New Testament references goes beyond the act of faith to include the continuity of faith. Faith is not a one-time act, but a way of life. The true believer, declared righteous by God, will, pre will, perse will, persevere, will persevere in faith as the pattern of his life. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, and Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. This statement is not just for Habakkuk, but for all of God's people. Our faith in God should not be determined by things we see with our eyes. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 reads, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Our faith in God is what separates us from the world. The world has no hope. We have the hope of the resurrection. Those who have confidence in themselves are not depending on their faith in God to see them through. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 5 reads, Yea, also, because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as well, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. The bitter verbal attack against the Babylonians served as the basis for this condemnation described in verses 6 through 20. They were proud and greedy, like Sheol and death. Look at Proverbs chapter 1, verse 12. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 20. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 15 and 16. They were never satisfied, but always wanted more. Hell, Hebrew Sheol, the unseen world of the dead, can be understood both as a reference to the grave and as the residence of the departed dead. This is speaking of a man who is lacking in moral character, he drinks heavily, he runs around, he is living for the desires of the flesh, and his flesh will die. The sad thing is, this type of person winds up in hell for all of eternity. In this particular instance, this is speaking of the Babylonians. They, as a nation, are headed for total destruction in hell. Verses 6 through 20. Five woes, five woes in the form of a taunt song, were pronounced upon the Babylonians and had in anticipation of their eventual judgment. Presented in five stanzas of three verses each, the five woes were directed at five different classes of evildoers. Verses 6 through 8, the first row charged extortion, for example, plundering nations under threat of great bodily harm for the purpose of making themselves rich. As a result, they were to become plunder to those nations who remained. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 6 reads, Shall not all these take up a parable against him, and a taunting proverb against him, and say, Woe well to him that increaseth that which is not his, how long, and to him that ladeth himself with thick clay. All these, all these, a reference to the nations who suffered at the hands of the Babylonians. Woe, an interjection often used in prophetic literature to introduce a judicial indictment or a sentence of judgment. Look at Isaiah chapter 5, verses 8, 11, 18, 20 through 22, and Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 13. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 1 and Amos chapter 5 verse 18 and Amos chapter 6 verse 1. Thick clay, thick clay. The Babylonians exacted heavy taxation of conquered nations. Such action often accompanied loans with excessive interest made to the poor. 
Look at Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 10 through 13, 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, and Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. All of the nations who have been captured and their people killed by these ruthless Babylonians have taken up a parable against them. They know that God will bring condemnation upon these evil people. They just do not know when. They have taken countries and people that do not belong to them. They are really asking God, how long will he wait to punish these evil men? The clay and the scripture that we just went through speaks of things that are earthly. The things they have piled up and called wealth will pass away. They are things of this earth. We Christians should lay up our treasures in heaven where nothing can destroy them. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 7 reads, Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee, and awake that shall vex thee, and thou shalt be for booties unto them? Shall they, the survivor nations, from whom taxation was exhorted in verse 8, even their people that the Babylonians take captive are no more to them than the inanimate things they count as their booty. The people are thought of as possessions of the captors. Their cruelty towards their captives will come right back to them when they are under the judgment of God. The army which destroys them will be just as cruel to them as they had been to their captives. Verses, verse 8 and 11. The proud and seemingly impregnable city of Babylon fell to Cyrus the Great in 539 B.C. Do as much to its own inner corruption as to the presence of the great conqueror. According to the reports of the ancient world, Cyrus was hailed as a liberator. Look at Isaiah chapter 45, verses 1 through 3. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 8 reads, Because thou hast spoiled many nations, all the remnant of the people shall spoil thee because of men's blood and for the violence of the land, of the city, and of all that dwell therein. Those that survived the persecutions of the Roman emperors, those that were left of the great numbers put to death by them, those under Constantine rose up, and by just retaliation spoiled them of all their power and wealth. Because of men's blood, because of men's blood, the blood of the saints and martyrs of Jesus, of those under the altar whose blood cried for vengeance, look at Revelation chapter 6 verse 9, which was shed under the ten bloody persecutions. Or because of the blood of a man, of Adam, as it may be rendered, the blood of Christ, the second Adam, which though shed at the instance of the Jews, yet by the order of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. And for the violence of the land and of the city and all that dwell therein, that is, for the violence and injuries done to the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem and the inhabitants thereof, as the Targum says, and so Jarchi, and which were done by the Romans to those places and people under Titus Vespasian, when he invaded the country of Judea and made it desolate. He besieged and took Jerusalem and burned it with fire in 70 AD, destroyed great numbers of its inhabitants, and carried them captive, and sent great multitudes of them to the mines, as well as for what were done to the Christians in every country and city where they dwelt, and to the city of the living God, the church, the heavenly Jerusalem, and the citizens of it, who were used by them in a very cruel and inhuman manner, and for which vengeance would be and was taken upon them. Babylon had been a conqueror that seemed impossible to stop. God would bring judgment of Babylon by the Medes and Persians, the cruelty and the bloodshed the Babylonians have brought on others would bring the very same type of treatment upon them. 
They had gone much further than God intended them to when they attacked Judah and Jerusalem. God's judgment of the Babylonians would be severe for this reason. Verses 9 through 11. The second charge of premeditated exploitation born out of a covetousness was a continuation of verses 6 to 8. The walls of their houses, built with stones and timbers taken from others, testify against them. Look at verse 1. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 9 reads, Woe to him that coveteth an evil covetousness to his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of evil. Set his nest on high, wanting to protect themselves from any recriminations their enemies might seek to shower upon them. The Babylonians had sought to make their cities impregnable and inaccessible to the enemy. Look at Isaiah chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. The Babylonians had taken great wealth from the people they had defeated. They had taken far more than their needs and left the people without anything. They had thought so highly of themselves, they had tried to lift themselves up as high as the skies by all wealth they had obtained at others' expense. Excuse me, I need to get a drink here. <clears throat> Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 10 reads, Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people and hast sinned against thy soul. Thou hast consulted shame, the, the Babylonian leaders, by counseling to kill, shamed themselves and harmed their souls. This of, score, this, of course, is speaking to the Babylonians. They had made a terrible name for themselves by their cruelty and battle. People both feared and hated them. They have gone so far with their cruelty. They have sinned in their souls. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 11 reads, For the stone shall cry out of the wall, and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. Of their own house, some from among themselves that truly feared God, seeing the evil practices done among them, and abhorring them, such as their covetousness, ambition, murders, excommunications, and, anath and anathemas, a formal curse by a pope or a council of the church, excommunicating a person or denouncing a doctrine, should cry out against them in their sermons and writings, and the beam out of the timber shall answer, such as were of intimate note in things civil, as beams and rafters in the house. Emperors and governors of provinces who observed the complaints of godly ministers and people answered to them and checked the evil bishops and clergy, hindering them in the pursuit of their schemes and brought them to shame and confusion. Abban Ezra observes that the word signifies the hard place in the wood or the harder part of it, the knotty part, or the knot in it, in which, and which is confirmed by the use of the word in the Arabic language as Hodinger observes. And so, may have respect to such persons as were raised up at the beginning of the Reformation, who were of rough dispositions and hardy spirits, fit to go through the work they were called to, such as Luther and others who answered and were corresponded to the doctrines of those before mentioned who preceded them. For not a beetle, as a Septuagint version, which breeds and lives not in wood, and so represents heretics, as Jerome, much better as some of the Greek versions, a worm, though rather the word may signify a brick, as it is used by the Talmudist, for one of a span and a half, which answers well enough to a stone in the former clause. Nor is it unusual with heathen writers to represent stones and timber speaking when any criminal silence is kept. Luke chapter 19 verse 40 reads, And he answered and said to them, I tell you that, if these should hold their peace, 
the stones would immediately cry out. We do know the handwriting on the wall condemned these evil people. Perhaps that is what is intended here. In their time of joy and reverie, a hand from God wrote a message of condemnation and destruction upon them. Verses 12-14 The third woe accuses them of being ruthless despots, building luxurious palaces by means of bloodshed and forced labor. Like the fire that burns everything given to it, their labors would all be futile, having no lasting value. Look at verse 13, and also look at uh, Micah chapter 3, verse 10. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse, verse 12 reads, Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood, and establisheth a city by iniquity. Nebuchadnezzar encircled the inner city with three walls, and the outer city also with three, all of burnt brick. And having fortified the city with wondrous works, and adorned the gates like temples, he built another palace near the palace of his fathers, surpassing it in height and its great magnificence. He seemed to strengthen the city and to establish it by outward defenses. But it was built through cruelty to conquered nations and especially God's people, and by oppression against his holy will. So there was an inward rottenness and decay in what seemed strong and majestic, and which imposed on the outward eye it would not stand, but fell. Babylon, which had stood since the flood, being enlarged contrary to the eternal law, to the eternal laws of God, fell in the reign of his son, such as all empire and greatness, raised on the neglect of God's laws by unlawful conquest and by the toil and sweat and hard service of the poor. Its aggrandizement and seeming strength is its fall. Daniel's exhortation to Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter 4, verse 27 reads, Redeem thy sins by righteousness, and thy inequities by showing mercy on the poor. This implies that oppressiveness had been one of his chief sins. They, sh they, shed, they shed much blood to get the wealth they had. They are condemned for building great buildings over the shed blood of those they conquered. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 13 reads, Behold, is it not of the Lord of hosts that the people shall labor in the very fire, and the people shall weary themselves for very vanity? Literally, to suffice the fire by God's appointment, the end of all their labor is for the fire. What may suffice it to consume? This is the whole result of their labor. And so, it is as if they had toiled for this. They built sealed palaces and gorgeous buildings only for the fire to consume them. And the people shall weary themselves for very vanity. They weary themselves. And what was their reward? What had they to suffice and fill them? Emptiness. This is from the Lord of hosts, whom all the armies of heaven obey, and all creatures stand at his command against the ungodly, and in whose hand are all the hosts of earth, and so the oppressors also, to turn as he wills. I need to stop here for a minute. I will be right back in just a moment. All right, I am back. Let me get my microphone situated here. All right, there we go. Where were we? Oh, 
All right. Near upon the first stage of the fulfillment, Jeremiah reinforces the words with the name of Babylon. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 58 reads, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the broad walls of Babylon shall be utterly broken, and her high gates shall be burned with fire, and the people shall labor in vain, and the folk in the fire, and they shall be weary. Babylon, which was built, which was built to such magnific magnificence with the slave labor, was but vanity. The people building this magnificent place labored as if in fire. It was not a labor of love, but forced labor. All of their labor is in vain, because Babylon and all its finery are destroyed, never to be built again. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14 reads, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Filled in contrast to the self-exaltation of the Babylonians whose efforts came to naught, God promised that the whole earth would recognize his glory at the establishment of his millennial kingdom. Look at Numbers chapter 14 verse 21, Psalm 72 verse 19, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, and Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9. God's glory far surpasses all the glory of these big cities like Babylon. The following scripture is almost identical to the one I just read. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9 reads, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. The following scripture tells what the above scripture means better than I could explain it. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 11 reads, And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. The knowledge of the glory of God, excuse me, the knowledge of the glory of God will cover all the people of the earth in that day. Verses 5 through 17. The fourth charge is debauchery, wherein Babylon forced others to become intoxicated and poisoned, making them behave shamefully and become easy prey. As a result, they too would be forced to drink the cup of God's wrath and exposed to public shame. Look at Jeremiah chapter 49 verse 12. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 15 reads, Woe well unto him, excuse me, something's not right here. <laughs> okay, that's going to be better. Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 15, verse 15 reads, Woe well unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. A severe woe is pronounced against drunkenness. It is very fearful against all who are guilty of drunkenness at any time and in any place from the stately palace to the paltry alehouse to give one drink who is in want, one who is thirsty and poor or a weary traveler or ready to perish is charity. But to give a neighbor drink that he may expose himself, may disclose secret concerns or be drawn into a bad bargain, or for any such purpose, this is wickedness. To be guilty of this sin, to take pleasure in it, is to do what we can towards the murder of both of soul and body. This, there is woe to him, and punishment answering to the sin. The folly of worshiping idols is exposed. The Lord is in his holy temple in heaven, where we have access to him and the way he has appointed, may be welcome his salvation and worship him in his earthly temples through Christ Jesus and by the influence of the Holy Spirit. This drink is alcoholic in nature. The drink was given to the neighbor so his judgment would be impaired. The person who gave the drink to his neighbor had an ulterior motive. This is speaking of the impaired judgment of the nations had dealing with Babylon. These Babylonians are like the evil Babylon in Revelation, which leads the people to sin. The Babylonians have shamed them. 
Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 16 reads, Thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink thou also. Let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. Foreskin, the word, this word refers to nakedness, expressing in Hebrew thought the greatest contempt, the sign of being an alien from God. Look at Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4. Cup of the Lord's right hand, a metaphor referring to divine retribution, served up by his powerful right hand. Look at Psalm 21, verse 8. What the Babylonians did to others would also be done to them. Verses 7 and 8. Shameful spewing shall be on thy glory, carrying out the metaphor of drunkenness. Here is a reference to the humiliation of shameful spewing. The very thing in which they gloried would become the object of their shame, while the Lord's glory would be as the waters cover the sea. Verse 14. Babylon's glory would be covered with shame. Babylon is thought of by all the other nations in a shameful way. God exposes them, and they are destroyed. They are shown to be uncircumcised. They do not belong to God. They will drink of the cup of God's indignation. Revelation chapter 18, verse 6 reads, Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works in the cup which she hath filled to her double. This is speaking of Babylon. Habakkuk Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 17 reads, For the violence of Lebanon shall cover thee and the spoil of beasts which made them afraid because of men's blood and for the violence of the land, of the city, and and of all that dwell therein. Violence. This reference may be to the ruthless exploitation of of trees and animals, providing building materials, firewood, and food, which often accompanied military campaigns. Lebanon's beautiful cedars were plundered for selfish purposes. Look at Isaiah chapter 14, verses 7 and 8, and Isaiah chapter 37, verse 24. It also includes the slaughter of man, the second part of verse 17, suggests that it may symbolize Israel and her inhabitants, whom Nebuchadnezzar conquered. Look at 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 9, Jeremiah chapter 22, verse, verses 6 and 23, and Ezekiel chapter 17, verse 3. The Babylonians had destroyed the forest of Lebanon. They had destroyed the temple in Jerusalem and Judah as well. They were a threat to man and beast. They destroyed the beast along with the people who got in their way. They killed with the sword, burned, and took captive. They were a very violent people. Verses 18 through 20. The fifth accusation is idolatry, exposing the folly of folly of following other gods. Look at Isaiah chapter 41, verse 24, and Isaiah chapter 44, verse 9. The destruction of the Babylonians would demonstrate the superiority of the Lord over all gods. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 18. What profiteth the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it, the molten image and a teacher of lies, that the maker of his work trusteth therein to make dumb idols. The graven images the church of Rome enjoys, enjoins the worship of, the images of the Trinity, of Christ, of the Virgin Mary, of angels and saints departed, and which are still continued since the Reformation. But of what profit and advantage are they? They may be profitable to the engraver, who is paid for making them, the metal or matters of, matters of which they are made, if sold and converted to another use. But as deities and worshipped as such, they are of no profit to them, that worship them. They cannot hear their prayers, nor answer them, cannot bestow any favors upon them, and deliver them out of distress, and particularly cannot save them from the judgments before denounced. The molten image and the teacher of lies. Nor is a molten image any ways profitable 
which is made of liquid matter, gold or silver melted and poured into a mold from whence it receives its form. It may be profitable to the founder and to the metal to the owner if put to another use, but as a God is of no service. And both the graven and molten image, the one and the other, each of them is a teacher of lies. And so unprofitable. If they are layman's books, as they are said to be, they do not teach them truth. They do not teach them what God is in his nature and perfections, what Christ is in his person and offices, what angels are who have no material existence nor the saints, that the maker of his work trusteth therein to make dumb idols, or whilst making dumb idols, which is great stupidity indeed, that while a man is graving an image or casting an idol, which are lifeless, senseless things that can neither move nor speak, yea, are his workmanship, yet put his trust and confidence in them that they can do him service he needs. An image cannot help them. It has no power to save them. Their false gods will be of no help at all when the judgment of God comes upon them. They have put their faith and trust in false gods, not in God. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 19 reads, Woe unto him that saith to the wood, Awake to the dumb stone, arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. Awake, arise. Compare the sarcasm with that of Elijah's words to the prophets of Baal of Mount Carmel. Look at 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 27, and Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 27. This is speaking of the things the false gods were made with. Their false gods are not alive and cannot speak or help them. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 20 reads, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Holy temple, a reference to heaven from where the Lord rules. Look at Psalm 11 verse 4. And answers the prayers of those who seek him. Look at 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 28 to 30, and Psalm 73, verse 17. Keep silence. In contrast to the silence of idols, verse 19, the living, sovereign ruler of the universe calls all the earth to be silent before him. None can assert his independence from him. All the earth must worship in humble submission. Psalm 46, verse 10, in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 15. This is in direct contrast to their false gods. The Lord is alive. He can and does speak to his people. He can help or punish his people whenever he chooses because he is God. His holy temple here is speaking of his throne in heaven. God is not like those idols which had to be in one place at one time. He is omnipresent everywhere all the time. He is not limited to one location. His presence hovered over the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies in the temple of Jerusalem. The unfaithfulness of his people caused him to leave. All of the earth should keep silence before the Lord because all of it belongs to him. He created it all for himself. I will give you these scriptures to ponder on about this very thing. Acts chapter, Acts chapter 17 verse 29 reads, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. The Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 13. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. Colossians chapter 1 verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 reads, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, 
whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 reads, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. This has been Empty Cross Ministries devotional time. I'm Brother David. The name of the program is KJV Exposed. Once again, because we use the King James Version. Let's close out here with a word of prayer after I get a drink here. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you seeking your grace, seeking your face, Father. We know you are all-powerful, all-powerful, all-knowing, and ever-present, Father. You know our hearts and our minds. We ask that you forgive us when we fall short of your glory, whether it be in word, thought, or deed, Lord. Father, you are the creator of all things. Father, we ask that you be with those who are suffering from any kind of illness, whether it be physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual. Just put your healing touch upon them. Be with those who are facing the loss of a loved one. Just make your presence known to them in ways that only you can do, in ways that they can see, hear, feel, and understand, Lord. Father, we thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for the rain. We thank you for the beauty of your creation. It speaks of your power, of your glory, and of your honor, Father. All living things, from the small creatures, such as chipmunks and squirrels, to larger creatures, such as elephants and hippopotamuses, Father, they are all under your dominion and under your control, as we also are, Father. You made us a little lower than the angels, Lord. Father, we thank you, most of all, for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross, to shed his blood, because of our sins. Father, we ask that you also be with those that are in authority over us in this nation that we have elected to represent us, Father. Open their hearts and their minds that they be receptive to your word, to your laws, and your commands and your decrees, Father. And we pray this, that we might live peaceable, peaceable lives, Father. Father, once again, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross in our place for our sins. It's in his name we ask these things. Amen. Folks, stay safe, be blessed, stay in the word, and write the word upon your heart. Until next time, we'll be looking at Habakkuk chapter 3.